think you need to take the quote, which he just offered to us. BYU is finally where they always should have been, and hang that over your desk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a, uh, I'm gonna put a digital <laughs> copy of that quote in my book of remembrance. Very my own different. personal self worth is wrapped up in <laughs> whether my team wins or loses. Okay. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Interviews and insight from this week in Cougar Sports. Every Saturday, only on BYU Radio. To lead off, here's the double coverage interview of the week. Our guest in studio now is Caleb Lohner of the men's basketball team, who are just crushing it right now as well. Caleb, what's up, man? How you doing? Doing well. How are you guys? I'm good. I'm good. You, you excited for a baseball season, rocking the Rangers hat here? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Texas had some big signings. Uh, yeah. yeah, they did actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I know Coach Burgess wasn't happy about one of them. Yes, uh, the LA Corey Seager. Yeah, coming over. Yep. When when Caleb came in, I was before we came on. He he sat down and I, I was giving him a little bit of a. We were talking in shoot around the other day. Caleb was right right by me, and he made three straight like bottom of the net swishes right from all the way out on the emblem almost inside of half court. And I, I turned to Caleb and said, you have my permission to shoot that anytime you're on the emblem tonight. <laughs> he gave me a thumbs up, so I was expecting that shot. But instead, he, you know, he told me that he, he decided to do that base, baseline throw down. He felt like that was – Yeah, I think that was pretty good. That was yeah. better for the crowd. Yeah. It was better for the crowd. What was that moment like for you? It was a little more flow in the offense with that, you know. <laughs> you need like an end-of-half situation there. Although, let's be honest, like it feels like three of the past four or five games, you guys have made a bucket in the last like three seconds as we see the yeah, dunk. Yeah, we, we see the one. Of the first half. Like you guys have been able to execute we have. great plays at the end of the halves. Yeah. I think every single bucket that we've had right before the half has been huge because it's been just kind of like a complete momentum shifter, which has been yes. awesome. Going into halftime, I know it's like a big confidence boost. And St. Mary's was the biggest one. Yeah. Boost laying that in, it was like everyone yeah. was juiced. Yeah. Is that, is that something like it's happened more than once? Is that something that the mindset of this team is, hey, wait a minute, we're not going into the locker room like this. We've got to make some plays down the stretch. Is that a conscious thing, or has it just happened? I think so. I think it's just guys making plays. Uh, I mean, there's all sorts of dudes, but T. John making the pass to Seneca. There's a few games ago, Spencer had a steal for a layup. Just guys being yep. super aware of the clock and then just making a play. Okay, do, do you care whether you're a top 25 team or not? This team's just one out. We thought you'd be in. Does that matter to you? Personally, I don't think I think about it, but I mean, as a team and as a collective, yeah, it's it's really cool to look at your team and see that in the net that you're ranked in the top 25. But that that'll matters, come. That matters more than the the opinion based polls. Yeah. So AP poll today, you're one yes. out, but 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 you you would say you you would be more you would be more worried about net because that has effect on seeding the NCAA. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, probably. But I mean, at the end of the day, like we're just gonna keep doing our thing, and like I mean, this has happened the last few years, but. We know if we keep winning and we keep playing the way we are, everything's going to turn out fine. Yes, it will. And uh, we're talking about a few, as Gregor Bell called them, called them quad jumpers. Uh, Missouri State beats Loyola Chicago, jumps into quad one. Oregon, we've been waiting for Oregon sort of be a better win. You yeah. Know, it's quad one, which is awesome. St. Mary's climbed in the top 30 home game. That's quad one. Do you, are you guys looking at the team sheet uh, as players, or is that more of a coaching staff thing? I think it's more of a coaching thing. I mean – I think as a player, there's already so much you're worrying about. And so <laughs> if you kind of overload your mind with too much stuff, it's probably not a good idea. So we just take it game by game, go on over the game plan, do what we got to do, and yeah. And this team's kind of had to reinvent itself. We talk about Oregon moving into a quad one, and, and that seems like a long, long time ago. Yeah. And, and since the beginning of the year, you guys started the year, you're probably going to play a lot of three, play some four. Um, probably rarely have to play the five because because they'd have Richie there and they'd slide Gavin down. Then you we were lose. for a sec. Yeah, you're yeah. playing a lot of five. Yeah, well yeah. now and yeah. and now all of a sudden you know Richie goes down, um, Gavin has the ACL tear. This team's had to reinvent itself. How, how have you guys been able to just keep this thing on the rails and con- and continue to get better without those two guys? I think just trusting each other. Like we're all working for the same thing and we all have the same goals for this team and. I mean, yeah, we had some rough injuries at the beginning of the year. And even in my spot, I definitely looked at it as like, dang, now I'm probably going to be moved a little bit in a different direction of this team. But for me, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go out. I'm going to do what I can to help this team win. I know that everybody has been stepping up on this team to make huge plays and help win games, which I know everyone's seen, which, again, just speaks to the character of this team. And But, yeah, I think 
we've kind of started to reinvent ourselves and we're starting to feel this flow, at least personally, that's what I feel. I think, but I think the backbone of all of that is just trusting each other. I think everyone's starting to trust each other more on the offensive end of the floor, on the defensive end of the floor, moving the ball, being in the right spot on defense. So, You, you mentioned that your role's different than it was maybe with Rich and, and, and Gav out there. What do you see your role right now? Like, what, what, do you, what do you need to do to help this team win? I think a little bit of everything. I need a guard. I need to rebound the ball, um, finish around the rim, uh, be a, like a leader on the floor talking to guys. And so I'm kind of happy for that role. Like I've been, I want to step up in that leadership spot and just keep building off of that. But it's been a fun year. We're talking to Caleb Bloner, sophomore on the BYU Ben's basketball team here on BYU Sports Nation. Walk me through the uh, mental journey you go on of being a freshman, <clears throat> coming in. And, and I don't know if it's everybody like this, but I would imagine in that position you're like, dude, at some point I'm going to be the guy and I'm going <laughs> to average 20 a game or whatever. But that's not always the case, right? Alex Barcelo three seasons ago was a nine-point-a-game guy, fourth option. Now he's like the alpha offensively, right? Um, how, how have you navigated that of like, all right, your role is X, Y, Z, and maybe when you showed up it was ABC? I mean, I think at the end of the day we want to win. And so if my role has to be something that is a little bit different than what I thought it would be to win, I'll do it. And I think that's more important to have the team's agenda than mine because, again, we all got each other's back. Like, we all trust each other. And so, to me, that's more important. And that's not to say that you won't be that in the future. Just yeah. right yeah. now. But for right now. That's what this team needs, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and this team seems to, and, and you, you're in the locker room and you're out on the floor, you know way better than us looking from the outside. And we're a little closer than most because we're sitting there with you in practice and those yep. kinds of things. But it seems like everybody has that mentality like, hey, whatever I need to do. Seneca Knight was a leading scorer at San Jose State, one of the top scorers in the Mountain West Conference, and he comes and is playing a different role. But, but to a man, does everybody feel the way you do? I think so. And I think everyone's starting to understand, like, hey, if we want to be as good as we can possibly be, this is just what we have to do. And we all talk about sacrifice all the time, and I think it's just a perfect example of guys sacrificing for something bigger than themselves. Mm, that's awesome. And we've seen that on the defensive end. Where this team, this team's so good on defense and rebounding. What has it taken to be this good? Uh, practice, practice, tons of film, and then just the same mindset every day in practice and every day in the game. I think we just it's like a, a beat down of the same things so much that your mind actually starts to accept that's what you have to do. <laughs> like and so, what things are you talking about? Like going to the glass talking on defense, like being in the right spots, because in practice, if you're not in the right spots, you're going to get yelled at or you're going to run. But it's just kind of the classic stuff. But we do it so much. We do the same things every day. We work on footwork. We work on defense. We go over the game plan a million times. And so I think just the repetitiveness of that helps us all be in those spots. It, it's interesting, Caleb. I asked, I asked Mark Pope the other day, like, because you guys have had some games where you're not shooting the ball great for stretches, you know, pretty big stretches in the game, yet you continue to get stops and rebound the ball, and you're still in the game. And then you can win it at the end. I go, how does this team keep this mentality? And then he says, well, um, I think these guys understand that we have to do those things or we can't win with this group. So they understand the urgency of it. But then right after that, you guys go to practice. I'm not going to say who it was because it wasn't Caleb. And he said – if that's the way you're going to play defense, then why don't you just tell me right now? This is what Mark said. Why don't you just tell me right now and just tell everybody, I just don't want to play, Coach. I don't want to be on the floor. I do not want to play. Because it would be easier easier than me sitting here watching you not do it if you would just tell us all that that's what you don't want to do. Yeah. Then the player didn't say anything, and he said, oh, okay, then let's do it then, right? Yeah. And that's not unusual for market practice, right? No. But, I mean, it's again, it's just the same thing, like – if we want to win and if we want to be as good as we got to be, that's important. And so Coach is trying to just reiterating like how important that is because we've shown throughout the year like that will win us games. Did you play with Foose at Wasatch for a year or two? I did. How, how, how long that was That team it? had to be ridiculous. Yeah, we were pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and Richie Saunders as well. Yeah, right? yeah. crazy, right? Yeah. How, how many years was it with Foose there? I was there about a year and a half because I was only there about half of my junior year. So gotcha. The, the, the That's spring when you showed semester, up. yeah. Gotcha. So what what was he like when he showed up versus what he's like now? So I got there to Wasatch. I think it was his he – was, he's only been there for about two, two and a half years. And he was very, very quiet. Like even 
being around him now sometimes is like a shock to me, just like how lively he is and the things he says. Because I remember two years ago, he, that's just not how he was. And so I think he's just getting more and more comfortable with speaking English and more and more comfortable with like being in this position. But I love that dude, man. He's awesome. He had a moment in the Portland game where I, I was like, oh, he feels really comfortable now. He got an uh, he got an and one, and he he kind of looked at the guy. For a sec, shake, nod in his head, yeah. and I was like, "Oh, we've reached another level here." Um, his his growth potential is is incredible. What have you seen uh, him kind of become here, having been with him for a couple of years now? Yeah, I mean, I think he's becoming incredible. Just even his help that he, or all the things he does for this team, are just really special. Like, there's not a lot, not a lot of guys like Foose that can kind of do it all, um, and that have such like a good attitude about everything that you do. And every time you see him, he's going to smile. You look at him, he's going to smile. So he, he just brings an energy and a light to this team that I think is really important for us. That's awesome. Um, yeah, that dude's awesome. There's a really cool picture I'm probably going to post. But I have, like, my arm around him, and I'm, like, screaming at him. It, uh, there's all the students holding their little flags and the birthday candles. Right, from Saturday night. That's, yeah. That's cool. Okay, we're I, looking, we're looking, that. we're looking for that on social media today. <laughs> great that, photo. That's awesome. Um, Santa Clara coming up. S- s- sneaky, tough game on the road your thoughts on Santa Clara uh it's gonna be a tough game every road game every game in this league is gonna be a tough game but if we go into this game with the same mentality having prepared the way we do we're gonna be fine well congrats on the success it's been fun to see you break out offensively a little more and uh, we're looking forward to a big game Thursday yeah it'll be fun hey and and for the record every time I see like Travis Kelsey and these guys in these NFL games I'm like Caleb could play that spot in the NFL I think I think you'd be an NFL. Team. I dream about that sometimes. So. It's like my guilty pleasure. <laughs> and you're, and you're Especially from with Texas, the Cowboys, football, I'm like, right? they need some help. They need some help. You can play. <laughs> Just put me in. I'll put on thirty Mark, pounds like, and Mark throw it, me the ball. Mark it down when Kalen's Kel- going more. When Kalen's done, we know Kellen. We know their offensive coordinator. We know him well, so we're gonna let him know. When Kalen's done with basketball, <laughs> mark it down. We're the first ones that knew he was gonna play in the NFL as a tight end. You could be Jordan Cameron. Jordan Cameron was a tight end who played in the NFL. He was a scout squad guy here. Transferred to SC. Switched sports. Went pro bowler. I'm not saying switch, <laughs> you switch heard it, sports or school. You heard it here first when Caleb's playing in the NFL. There's a history We here. talked to him about it. We're going to facilitate it with Kellen Moore. So. <laughs> There's a men's basketball they, player who's played in the NFL. Thanks for being with us, Caleb. That was one of our favorite interviews this week. You're listening to the best of BYU Sports Nation. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. All right, uh, I am, uh, I'm going to read this under protest because I think this question is ridiculous. <laughs> Andy Reid is the only coach ever to take two different teams to four straight conference championships in the NFL, obviously doing it uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. with the Chiefs and previously with the Eagles. Uh-huh. But does he need another ring to solidify his legacy? Spencer, what say you? No, he doesn't need another Super Bowl ring to solidify his legacy, which is why it's perfectly fine for the Bengals to beat the Chiefs. Okay, Jason? Look, we're not going to give you a a pity victory. This is not going to help Andy Reid. He's already incredible and wonderful and fantastic, and we love Andy Reid. So if he loses, no, it doesn't hurt his legacy at all. It's totally okay if the Bengals beat the Chiefs. Okay, well, it's not okay, but no, he does not (laughs) need it. Honestly, he... There, he probably didn't need the Super Bowl for his legacy, but having it certainly cemented it. Well, now, I, yeah, I think that there well, were some naysayers. No, no, that there were. He did. There were, but I I'm think glad he, had, he, did he had done enough that I think he was still going to be a Hall of Fame coach. Getting the Super Bowl like ended any discussions, so he does not need it for for his legacy. Although adding another Super Bowl is going to be nice. No, please. What's the chance of a 49ers-Chiefs rematch, Mm -hmm. meaning BYU guys will be on both sidelines of the Super Bowl again? Look, it's, I don't want to say probable, but likely. Look, Chiefs are favored by a touchdown. The 49ers seem to own the Rams. Six wins in a row for the 49ers over the Rams. So, look, you would think that that's how this plays out. So, I would say likely. It's a coin flip. You know, I'm, I'm banking that one of the teams will feature BYU guys or a BYU guy in the Super Bowl. Both, I'd probably put it about, yeah, like 40%. The 49ers, yes, they have owned the Rams, but I, I don't know. I think I think the Rams are, the Rams playing, are playing much better. Playing better football yes. than the 49ers are overall right now. 
All right, we were just talking about this. BYU Women's Hoops drops from a three seed to a five seed in the latest bracketology. Does it all boil down to just other teams uh, leapfrogging the Cougars because of, of better wins? Yeah, and that's what stinks about this is BYU, and Charlie Cream told us this yesterday, they have, like, hit almost the ceiling as far as they can climb up bracketology. The three three seed is probably the ceiling for right. BYU. If they handle Gonzaga and they run the table, then they absolutely deserve a three. At worst, a four seed, Yeah, Jason. five. I, I, that's really surprising. me. But they're me. just going to be relying on other teams above them to continue to lose, and you hate to have that out of your control. So, yeah, that, that's what it's become. Scoreboard watching and then keep dominating the West Coast Conference. In a list of the best bars. <laughs> I can't believe we're having this discussion. No, not energy bars or candy bars, but like an actual bar or pub in every college town. Big Game Boomer listed so delicious <laughs> as the best bar in Provo. <laughs> Did Big Game Boomer get it right or is he wrong? And it's, I don't know, swig. Look, I am not going to answer this question because I'm not 100% sure which <laughs> one is currently the official one of BYU Athletics. So I'm going to say that he's in the right genre yeah. as to which one I don't know. Nobody said it couldn't be a soda bar, right? I think Big Game Boomer, absolutely. If he's not a BYU fan, he absolutely 100% perfectly understands BYU oh, he gets culture. It. He absolutely gets it, and I love it. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Joining us now is the publisher of the Extra Points newsletters, one of our favorites. It's been a while. Matt Brown is back with us to discuss big things in college athletics, specifically college football. Matt, great to see you. How are you? I'm I'm doing great, fellas. Always great to spend some time with both of you. Hey, listen, last week in the meetings of the NCAA, we went into them not thinking that it would be, I don't know, that big of a deal, but it kind of feels like it is becoming a big of a deal, and it's only going to become a bigger of a deal as we move forward. So what was your takeaway from last week's NCAA-wide meetings and deregulation and whatnot that was discussed there? Yeah, that's. I think that's a pretty healthy way of framing it, honestly. There, there wasn't a ton of you know, really hard news that came out of that week, unless, you know, you're really interested in Division three schools complaining about revenue distribution, which is a little bit niche, even for my niche newsletter. <laughs> but it really does set the table for um, some really huge conversations moving forward because this new NCAA constitution delegates a ton of authority specifically to Division One. So everything that you think about here in this bylaw and this rule book, what does it mean to be a conference? How is revenue from the NCAA men's basketball tournament distributed? Uh, what, how are we going to split up what it means to be Division One? All of these things are now on the table to be renegotiated and will be over the coming months. Now, it's interesting because there's little little pieces of information that are, are, as you mentioned, the next couple months will be discussed and perhaps decided, one of which is a Power 5 breakaway. Now that BYU is going to a Power 5, it's like, Hey, I feel. I guess I feel differently about it. I, although I wouldn't want March Madness to be blown up. I don't know if that's a football only conversation. What are you? What are you seeing and hearing? I have not really heard a lot of appetite among Division One schools for a formal P five G five complete breakaway. And part of the reason is because of the of the NCAA men's and women's basketball tournament. And and part of the reason that event makes a lot of money. You know, maybe maybe it's kind of weird to talk about it here, maybe in this market. But part of that is because America loves to gamble on it. And America loves to gamble on it because they want to bet on a Big Sky team or a Summit League team and not a 6-10 and 10 Virginia Tech team. So it really does make sense for everyone to have this as a combined event. But one thing that you are hearing a lot throughout these, these conversations are P5 leaders saying, we want more autonomy. And they already have autonomy to do basically everything that they want. So when you hear someone say, we want more autonomy, what they mean is, we want more money. And I think that that's going to manifest itself in a pretty different NCAA tournament over the coming years. That might mean that the unit payout system is different. Maybe it goes away. Maybe it increases. Maybe it's added for women's basketball. Maybe the tournament expands. 
or maybe we get rid of the automatic bid uh, system. So maybe uh, only the certain certain low major or mid major conferences get automatic bids, and more of those go to power leagues. Which, if you're BYU and you care about basketball, maybe that's something you actually like because the Big Twelve is an extremely difficult conference, and it's about to get more difficult. Maybe you would want a system where you know, hey, if I finish tenth in this league, I'm probably still going to make the tournament. Yeah, wild to think about. Matt Brown with us on BYU Sports Nation. You mentioned more money. The Power 5 schools specifically are at the front of that. Does that mean more money for the student-athletes with the emergence of name, image, and likeness, in your opinion? Well, it, it, it definitely is. The question, I think, is going to be what mechanism you know, uh, forces that. Because we have, uh, there's a couple of things all happening at once. We have the name, image, and the market, name, image, and likeness marketplace blowing up. That's helping athletes at BYU. It's helping athletes at UVU. Athletes all over the all over the country, and that's I think independent of anything that happens with this changing constitution. You also have the federal court system, and like not just liberal judges, but really conservative judges too, saying. Maybe we should take a look at these assumptions we've had about amateurism. Maybe if somebody is working 35 hours a week for an enterprise that makes 11 gajillion dollars in television <laughs> revenue, maybe they should be considered employees rather than, you know, warrior poet student athletes or whatever the designation is right now. And so that might mean maybe that means we have unionization. Maybe that means they become direct employees and a program like Utah or BYU or USC maybe better equipped to navigate that system than maybe somebody like Southern Utah or, uh, or, or Utah Tech, right? So, you know, and those are questions that the NCAA themselves can't totally navigate. It's going to depend on what the courts say. It's going to depend a little bit on what Congress says. And I know that stinks because if there's one thing I know college football fans in this market love to hear, it's we can't wait to see what Congress is going to do. But that's <laughs> part of what the reality is right now. Look at you dropping uh, Utah Tech and and Summit and Big Sky. Ah, you you know the audience. That's very that's very good. Okay, um, so you just talked about it. Are we gonna Are we going to have a pay for play situation where it's just straight up like amateurism is is sort of gone? Like yes, you you're you're paid to do it. like that's up in the air, right? Like that could happen if they wanted to because they have a new constitution. Yeah, that that is something that I think is is a possibility. Everybody has to grapple with. You know, I remember I was talking with uh, with Bubba Cunningham, who's the athletic director at North Carolina, uh, a couple of weeks ago in, out in Las Vegas, and I posed this question to him, and he said, "Yeah, this is something we're talking about. And if that world happens, UNC is still going to play college sports. The, the question for us is how we're going to pay for women's lacrosse or swimming or some of these other sports. But whether they're employees." Whether there's uh, whether it's through NIL, whether it's something else, somebody is still going to wear the, the baby blue jersey and play basketball at the Dean Dome. Um, but if you're an AD right now and you're not thinking about, well, is this system going to stay the same in five years? What happens if the courts say we have to pay people? What happens if there's a hybrid? You have to at least think about it. I, I bet if we went into Tom's office right now, there's going to be a lot of spreadsheets somewhere that's you know forecasting what would we do if the Supreme Court then says X in 2025. Dennis Dodd of CBS Sports joined us recently, and he is of the opinion that with the separation potentially happening, especially financially between Power 5 programs that are naturally just going to get more money because that's what they do compared to some of these lower-tier Group of 5 teams, that some sports are going to be cut. Matt, do you see Group of 5 teams cutting sports moving forward because of the discrepancy in how much money is distributed between Power 5 programs and some of these lower-tier schools? Yeah, you know, I I think most of them won't have to, but I can definitely see a world where they'll decide to do that. And and one of the things I think that's important to think about for G5 programs or mid or low majors is that they sponsor some of these other sports for different reasons. You know, thinking back to, you know, not far where I grew up in, in Ohio, you have schools like Youngstown State that want to sponsor lots of programs, even if they're not even going to sell a single ticket, because they want that they want that tuition money. They want, they want to boost their enrollment, and they realize, hey, if I have a swim team, you know, most of those athletes aren't going to be on full scholarship, um, and then they can give us some tuition because we can't even get butts in the, in like, in the school right now. That's not the world where BYU is. That's not the world where, where Utah is. But even if there's a, prof- a professional model, I think you'll see plenty of mid-majors, low-majors, and G5 programs that are trying to boost enrollment, maybe even add sports rather than drop them. Other schools are going to look at this and realize it makes more sense for us to invest this money into football and basketball. Um, And I would say if you care very deeply about collegiate tennis, 
you should think about other ways that that system could work because it may not be able to be sustainable with what we're doing now. There's so much money in this game, and it's going into the pockets of certain schools right now. Is it inevitable? Well, it already is competitively. There's a, a massive gap competitively. Like, wh- where is this headed? Um, you know, if you're if you're San Jose State or Western Michigan in having football, but not actually competing at the highest level, right? And even a team like BYU that is not on the same level as Alabama and Georgia, but who is? You know what I mean? And, and Clemson had an off year, but who knows? They'll be back soon when they find the next Trevor Lawrence or whatever. Um, wh- where yeah, is this headed? one does. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I joke with people that I'm like, if my crystal ball really works, my newsletter is going to be a lot more of an eight bucks a month. Like you, <laughs> you, you, can, you can put me on retainer, right? I think if you're a Western Michigan or a San Jose State, you have to have some, some difficult and uncomfortable conversations about what success looks like for your athletic department. If you're going to, if your, if your department gets together and says, listen, the only way we're going to balance this budget, the only way we could do the things we want to do is if we go eight and four and make the Arizona bowl. Well, you need to either come up with 20 million more dollars or you need to, to get out of the game and, and do something else. And there's, I think we could probably think of a couple of division one schools that maybe are fooling themselves a little bit and pretending that they're playing the same sport as Alabama, or honestly, even playing the same sport as, as Cincinnati, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's not what Louisiana Monroe is doing. That's not really what UMass is doing. But if you have your, if you define success differently, maybe it doesn't matter that you're never going to beat Alabama or anything. I mean, I, I think BYU fans would agree. Hey, we had a great season last year. We had a great season the year before that, even though we were never really in the race to win a national championship, it's, it's a different system. And I imagine there's going to be some significant reconfigurations in college football over the next couple of years. And maybe Eastern Michigan and Western Kentucky are playing in a different classification, but it just, it, it, it just depends on how you really value success. And this is a different sport than the NBA or anything else, because success doesn't necessarily mean, mean winning a title. There's a lot of fun football, a lot of fun basketball that's played every year that has nothing to do with what happens in the college football playoff. I think. Matt Brown, publisher of the Extra Points Newsletters and College Sports Insider with us on BYU Sports Nation. Everybody has an opinion these days, Matt. So knowing what you know and having traveled to these meetings and spoken with athletic directors and high-level people at different universities, what do you think is the recipe for success overall for college sports to still maintain some integrity, be competitive, and be appealing to fans? That's, that's a great question, and and I I may be a little bit different, I think, from some other reporters because I don't think we ever really had amateurism. I don't think that this system ever really was completely competitively fair. People have been cheating since 1905. Like, <laughs> Yale had bag men. Princeton had bag men. The schools that don't even exist anymore were, were you know, going into the, the local steelworkers hall and just grabbing anybody <laughs> off the floor to come play left tackle. So, like, I don't, I don't look at this with any illusions here. I, I, think, I think what's important – big picture is that the, all this money that's coming into this system is, is distributed in a way where the people who are doing the most work, uh, which I think are the athletes get either long-term health care or, or some other kind of financial protections. I don't think it's fair for a coach, even at a bad team, a team that's going to finish in last place in the sec West to make $7 million a year while the left tackle is one knee injury away from potentially losing everything. Yeah. And honestly, I think a lot of fans really agree with that too. Like the, the pro sports, are set up the same way. There's enough money to go around. There's enough money to go around, I think, to support 100-plus FBS programs. It's just a matter of figuring out how to share it in a way that uh, allows the most possible people to participate. And that's not something really American sports do very well. Uh, And I hope that maybe we can find a way to do that a little bit better in college football moving forward. Matt, fantastic stuff. For those who don't know, how can they find more of your content? You can find Extra Points at extrapointsmb.com. It's a newsletter that covers business and educational and administrative stories that shape college sports off the field. Uh, You can get it for free, uh, two uh, newsletters a week, or you can get a paid subscription to get everything. That's extrapointsmb.com. Fantastic work, my friend. Thanks for the time. We'll talk to you again soon. Always, Always good, fellas. Thanks for having me. Matt Brown, publisher of the Extra Points newsletters. That dude is informed. And well, he puts together a fantastic newsletter. Look at all the, uh, you know, the banners behind him. That was legit. When we started with him a couple years ago, he had like three up there, I swear. Now he has like 30. <laughs> it's like a big Hawaii one, too. Hawaii. Now that's a mess. Jeez. 
This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. On this, the 24th of January, in the year of our Lord, 2022, BYU Men's Hoops is 17-4, and 5-1 and one in West Coast Conference play, 25 in net, just outside the top 25, and now 4-1 and one in Quad 1 games. Over the weekend, we had some quad jumpers. Thank you to St. Mary's, Oregon, Missouri State for joining the Quad 1 party. Blaine, is this the best BYU team in the Mark Pope era here now in year three? They're making a case for that, which, which is surprising to me when, when – Gavin Baxter went down with that knee injury after they already had lost Richie Harward. I, I thought before the season started, this was absolutely going to be the best team that BYU had because um, I just felt like they had everything. They had inside presence. They had great, great guard play, had great expectations for Lucas. I thought Loner would take a step forward. Like all these pieces were going to be there. Then Harvard goes down and has, has an illness that's keeping him out for who knows how long. And then when Baxter goes down with that knee injury, I think – Wow, that, that just killed this season. Um, the inside presence, that rim-protecting presence, their ability to rebound, their ability to defend inside. You can't and ask a couple just, of freshmen right. from a different continent like, to I, I, carry I, I, that. I know who Foose was. I knew who Atiki was. But, barely say his name. Yeah, like, but how, how are they going to get it done? Well, well, guess what? They're getting it done. When, when I talk, every time we do a game, we get to talk to the opposing coach. Yep. Um, that afternoon at shoot-around, we watch the opposing team practice. And every single coach, without exception, um, starts off with, man, th- like Mark Pope's team, these guys really defend. Like they really ha- understand how to defend. And, man, they're always there on the catch. They're really good in three-point percentage defense. And if, and if you look, these coaches talk about it. The numbers bear it out. They're number 16 in the country in three-point percentage defense, top 20 team. Um, and then they also go, and, and, you know, I know they don't have the length that they had before, but these guys can rebound. Man, if you don't block out, they're going to get to the offensive glass. They're going to get second chances. They're going to they're gonna keep you to one and dones every time down the floor. This is just a really physical, really good rebounding basketball team. That's not what you're used to hearing about b You're used to hearing, man, they get up and down the floor. They can really shoot. Every coach starts with, they're so good defensively. They can afford to not shoot the ball well and stay in games. You're going to have to scrap to even stay close to them rebounding the ball. And these young guys have stepped up. We talk about Foose. You know, he, another double-double mm-hmm. just, just the other night. He's turning into a monster inside, and he's a great rim protector. We saw Atiki with three blocks the other night. He's, he's become a force, especially on the defensive end inside but, but I love the fact that guys like Caleb Loner and Gideon George and even Seneca Knight who's another new face Alex Barcelo who's a great rebounding guard these guys are going down and being part of that rebounding game and all of a sudden without Richie Harward and without Gavin Baxter this team is is a problem for folks they're a mismatch because they're so athletic they're not having pro- problems rebounding and the only game this year that I thought oh man just not having length hurt him was against Gonzaga. Yeah. But who has the length to hang with them anyhow? Chet Holmgren, Andrew, Timmy. I mean, like it's just like they're it's, the best front court in America. Who, who in the country matches up with that? Nobody know. does, know. right? It's and rough. so so we'll excuse them for that one. Every other matchup, um, they're fantastic. So, so it's a long answer, but I think they're setting themselves up the way they're playing right now to be the best team in the Mark Pope era. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Joining us now on BYU Sports Nation Live is editor-in-chief of the Athletic College Football and co-host of the Audible podcast, Stuart Mandel, friend of the program, Stuart, great to see you. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. Thanks, guys. Good to see you. Hey, what a wild turn of events uh, for BYU in the last 18 months, getting to the Power Five. And now here we are talking about, well, now that BYU's in the club, would, would BYU fans be okay with like this Power Five, Group of Five separation, or at least something that's even more significant dividing those two divisions? Is something like that even good for college football, Stuart, if, if, if you think about Power Five and Group of Five teams separating even further? 
I, I don't think it's good for college football the way it's it's currently structured. Um, I also I don't know what that would accomplish exactly. Um, when people talk about a power five breakaway, uh, I mean, certainly you couldn't do that in basketball. You would ruin March Madness uh, if you did that. Yeah. So uh, in football, you know, we're coming off a season in which a group of five team made the playoff for the first time. Um, obviously, the the latest wave of, of realignment and the trickle down it had did, you know, drastically affect some of these conferences, most notably Conference USA. And, and clearly they, you know, those schools have a uh, very different budget situation than um, the power five, but I don't know that the, like the group of five is keeping the power five conferences from doing anything. Um, you know, the, the, what happened at the NCAA convention this past week in terms of it's going to separate the divisions a little bit more like division one from division two, that to me was more important uh, because <laughs> truly there, that there's nothing in common there and there's no reason a, a division three school should have a say in how Ohio State or, or BYU, for that matter, um, <laughs> operates their athletic department. While the clear separation between P5 and G5, you know, like you said, it probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It certainly feels like, and we're already seeing this now, where the P5 conferences still make most of the decisions uh, because of the financial benefits that, you know, happen because of that. Any reason to think that's not going to get even stronger moving forward? It's all about, you know, right now they're so focused on college football playoff and college football playoff expansion. And, and by all indications, they're still, they're still intending to include the group of five in that. And in fact, the proposal that was put forth in June um, even allowed for the possibility of two group of five champions, re, you know, reaching uh, a 12 team playoff. So um now, are they going to, you know, I think other parts of college sports, in particular, the transfer portal is going to continue to widen that. What we're seeing ever since they went to, um, you know, last summer when it became for the first time uh, permissible for uh, guys to transfer and play right away across the board, you know, we are seeing what has already been happening in basketball for a while, where the top, it's becoming a farm system, you know, the top group of five players. In fact, this year, we've noticed some freshmen, some group of five freshmen who had a breakout season, and they immediately enter the portal because now is their chance to um, be recruited uh, by the major schools. I mean, that's, that to me is going to have a, a more detrimental effect on the group of five than any sort of um, NCA structure or legislation. Speaking of the transfer portal, it obviously is just getting bigger and bigger, and it, it has been a game changer in collegiate athletics, how how much has or how big has this gotten compared to what they thought it was going to be? Because even though they they knew it was going to change things, I don't re think they realized how big of a deal this was going to be. Yeah, and, and and you know, again, people keep using just referring to the transfer portal. It's not the transfer portal that has cr that made this so crazy. It's the immediate eligibility. Yeah, because we had the transfer portal. I think going back to 2018. Uh, yes, a lot of guys entered the transfer portal, maybe guys that probably shouldn't have and, and didn't find another destination, but transfers have always been part of college football. The difference is how in the span of about five years or so, we went from a very coach driven model where they could literally block guys from transferring to, you know, X number of schools to now the players have complete control. The players have complete freedom to leave when they want, play where they want. And I think that is obviously the coaches don't like it. It's caused a lot of, um, like you said, it's, it's a major shift to the sport where now uh, coaches are having to decide, Hey, I get 25 scholarships or now it's, you know, up to 32. Um, how many do I want to use on high school players? How many do, do I want to use on transfers? It's kind of like the NFL, right? Where a franchise has to decide, um, are we going to build through the draft or are we going to build through free agents? Are we trying to win right now? Or are we trying to, build for the future. And it's a, it's a fundamental shift. Uh, there's no question, a fundamental shift to, um, to college football, but it's one, I think people are just going to have to get used to. So I don't think we're going back. Um, it, uh, clearly all of the, um, all of the, the, the fundamental changes to college sports over the last five years have been about loosening restrictions. And it's no secret why that this all the way up to the Supreme court, the NCAA has been told you can't do this anymore. Yeah. Um, what you've been doing is illegal, actually. So 
there's no there's no scenario. I mean, I know a lot of fans don't like the transfer portal, think it should be, um, think it's gone too far. I don't think there's any scenario where you can now put the uh, genie back in the bottle because uh, if you do, that that's going to be the next lawsuit. Uh, the NCAA is trying to unfairly restrict athletes from moving around. Stuart Mandel, editor of in chief of the Athletic College Football, is with us on BYU Sports Nation, and I'm glad you brought that up because I was just going to ask you, based on this free agency scenario that we're in, essentially, and I just saw your article, outstanding stuff, by the way. Um, is there any type of regulation that the NCAA can legally implement here to try and slow things down? I think the only the, uh, of the various. Um... Suggestions that have been made, the, the most realistic to me would be basically kind of like how in recruiting there are there are dead periods and quiet periods and open periods. Doing something like that with the portal where it's not necessarily open for business year round. You know, there'd be certain months of the year or, or several weeks of the year where guys can enter their name and be contacted freely. And then other parts of the year uh, where they cannot. Um, now, that's that would be how it was written on paper. How it might actually work is it wouldn't matter uh, because <laughs> you know tampering. It, there's no way to control the tampering. And so if you say okay, uh, coaches can't call possible transfers in the month of October, um, they're just going to call their high school coach. They're going to call their parents. Uh, there's there's ways to get around that. So um, that that would be the but that would be the most realistic scenario. Also, I, I just try to remind people, this is brand new. Um, it was literally July 1st, I believe, or maybe a little bit before that, that the one-time transfer exception uh, got written into law. And it's going to take a while to normalize itself. And I think there's still a novelty, novelty to it right now. A lot of guys are rushing to do it. And some of them are going to, it's going to be great. They're going to get exactly what they want out of it. Some of them are going to find out there's not a great destination waiting. And that'll have a ripple effect. And it might lead to, um, people being a little bit more cautious, yeah. uh, you know, in the years to come. Stuart, what other changes can we expect over the next couple of months after last last week's meetings in Indianapolis? Uh, I wouldn't expect anything dramatic that quickly. Um, this was the first stage in, in what could play out over, I guess, a series, I don't know, maybe a couple of years of figuring out, okay, Division One, you are now allowed to govern yourself. How does that look? What does that look like? Um, Who's in charge? What would what, what that, uh, you know, if you're going to do a division one board of directors, what would that look like? Um, what issues are you allowed to take on? Um, so probably a lot of behind the scenes stuff at first, but I do think that everybody agrees kind of the stuff we've talked about. There's got to be the NIL will be a top of the agenda. Transfer portal will be top of the agenda. Recruiting, uh, should they um, unwind the early signing period? Uh, because of the effect it's having on the coaching carousel and, and guys getting fired um, earlier than ever. And, and a lot of the transfer portal, frankly, activity we're seeing is a direct result of coaches getting fired or, or coaches taking over in late November, early December. And, uh, you know, players that are caught up in that um, entering the portal. So um, there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed and, you um, but I don't know that it's going to happen in the next couple of months. It might be in the next couple of years. We briefly talked about a 12 team college football playoff, some expansion there. It's on top of mind of basically every college football fan. To me, it feels like a matter of if, but not when, but the big question is when, when do you yeah. think that the college football playoff will expand to the off talked about 12 teams? I think right now, uh, 2026 um the acc for one is kind of putting its flag in the ground and saying absolutely not we don't think it's the right, right time to expand earlier than that 2026 is when the contract comes up so we're going to have some sort of change then there have been there has been some thought that if they um if everybody would just hurry up and concede the 2024 is not gonna that the, they're not gonna be able to blow up the current contract and they have to start thinking about the next one you're going to end up agreeing to the exact same, almost the exact same thing that they're already talking about now, because the majority of the conferences want that 12 team playoff. So if you can get that agreed to, if you can get every, you know, most parties on board with that format, then could you work backwards and say, well, as long as we're going to be doing this in a few years, why don't we start it earlier? Um, but we're a long ways from that. Uh, they're still going to have another set of meetings here. I think in March, one more attempt to see if they can get everybody together, but it, uh, from all indications, and I've 
talk to most of the commissioners about it. They're very frustrated. It's a stalemate. And so uh, what they thought last June would be fairly easy um, to uh, reach an agreement on and implement early, uh, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. We have a lot of fun looking ahead, trying to forecast what BYU or what we think BYU can do when they join the Big 12 in 2023. What do you believe are realistic expectations for BYU joining that league in terms of how they fit and kind of where they fit when they when they join? It's realistic for BYU to expect to compete for conference championships. Um, that's, you know, Utah moved up from the Mountain West and, and, and won the Pac-12 last year. TCU won the Big 12 within a few years. Now, it may not be immediate. Uh, the lesson from those uh, teams, those when they moved up, um, and I know it's not exactly the same. They were moving up from a group of five conferences. But uh, at first, it took them a little while to build up the depth uh, to, you know, obviously maybe some adjustments and what type of athletes they recruited to, to reach that level. It didn't happen immediately, um, but it can happen. And BYU has such rich tradition. Uh, to me, they've, they've always been during this period of independence, a, a de facto power five program because they have the facilities and the resources that, and the fan support that, the, that those schools do. So um, there is no ceiling, in my opinion. It's just a matter of how quickly they can adapt. Stuart, as you assess BYU just from a national perspective, how prominent is the BYU name in the biggest of NCAA circles right now? Because we kind of have our perch and our our thoughts here, but you you run in some very different circles with some high level people. Well, you're giving me way too much credit to think I'm up on college basketball. I am not. I I, I will at some point before March Madness. But BYU is a strong brand. Um, always have been. Uh, you know, a lot of. I mean, I think what, what's been important during this period where they've been an independent is they, they play these games against Pac-12 schools, even SEC schools, uh, you know, and they win them. They win a lot of them. And uh, nobody in the Pac-12 is thumbing their nose at BYU right now with the success they've had against that conference. So you know, I think it's a strong brand. And when you look at the schools that are coming into the Big 12, BYU has the most established brand. Cincinnati is the hot brand, obviously, because of, of reaching the playoff this past year. But I don't think they're in a similar situation to, for instance, Houston, which is still, you know, trying to establish itself, has had some success, but is still trying to establish itself. Even UCF, with the 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 back-to-back great seasons they had, to me is still kind of seen as a new, a newish brand. Everybody knows BYU's history and tradition and and Heisman winner and, and all those things. So to me, it's like they're finally when they join the Big 12, like they're finally gonna be where they were supposed to be all mm-hmm. along, uh, in terms of being in that in that club as you referred to it earlier (laughs) i would like to commend you on a couple of things one for your ability to double down on the fact that byu were the pac-12 champs de facto because that was a fantastic rhetoric and (laughs) a lot of mileage out of that one Stuart. we really did (laughs) we hung a banner here for crying out loud much to the ire of utah fans just wish they'd won the bowl game it took a little Uh, bit of the luster off the yes it did but the pac-12 Champs lost to UAB in a bowl game, but go ahead. <laughs> and secondly, on the growth of the athletic, it's been fun to watch that. Uh, congratulations on all the success there. Thank you very much. It's been an exciting, uh, you know, ever since the announcement about the New York Times, it's been a very, very exciting few weeks for the athletic. Oh, fantastic stuff. If you want to find it, athletic.com. We go there on a daily basis. You can listen to Stuart Mandel on the Audible podcast as well. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. You got it, Stuart Mandel. That dude is informed. He is in. He's like great. I mentioned he he is in the highest of media circles in college football. Runs around with Bruce Feldman. Um, they have they have a lot of fun. It's just it's a great listen. Yeah, they're, they're, they're super informed. There are certain names in certain sports that when they say something, it matters. It 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 takes on a, a different level uh, of truth, and because you know it's coming from somewhere. It's not just being thrown out there that there's something behind that. And Stuart Mandel is one of those guys. I think you need to take the quote, which he just offered to us, of BYU is finally where they always should have been and hang that over your desk. Because you were the guy that never gave up hope, Jason, of BYU to the Big 12. You were the one tooting the horn, even in the darkest of days. And Stuart Mandel Mm -hmm. has just validated everything that you were behind for the last decade. That quote. I'm gonna I'm gonna put a uh, I'm gonna put a digital <laughs> copy of that quote in my book of remembrance. Make it make a th- T-shirt. You want the workout T-shirt? You just make your own workout T-shirt and put that quote on it. Done. It will. It, it's happening. <laughs> it will happen.
The best of BYU Sports Nation. We'll be right back. Rise and shout for the trending topics of the week here on the best of BYU Sports Nation. Don't sleep on the Broncos of Santa Clara. Jason, the folks in Las Vegas have this game as a three-point projection, giving the odds to BYU, I'll say, but ESPN's Basketball Power Index says 53% chance that Santa Clara beats BYU at the Levy Center. Ken Palm has BYU also as a three-point favorite with a 61% chance to win. Jason, metrics are really close. Yes. I didn't think that it would be this close. Right. But it is. Here we are. And this all ties into what Ken Pomeroy said earlier in the week, that BYU only has a 55% chance of winning both at Santa Clara and at Pacific. That to still which seems so low to I me. I know. It seems low. I, but is it? Is it? Are we sleeping on Santa Clara? Should we be more concerned about what BYU faces tonight? All right. L- before we get to... The, the meat of this discussion. Let's get to BYU's resume as of today. So let's get a BYU resume update. Net coming in at number 28, uh, down four. That That's because San Diego State got absolutely obliterated by Utah yes. State last night, which I'm totally okay with. Yes, Ken Palm there at 23. Team rankings, 81.8% chance of making the tournament. Bracket matrix, uh, a seven seed, 7.07 is what it says. Uh, quad one, they're four and one on those games. Quad two, which this game is tonight, by the way. Okay. Uh, the Cougars are four and three, and then quad three and four games, uh, the Cougars are seven and zero. Oh. Yeah. So now let's compare that, because this will help with the discussion. Okay. Let's compare that with Santa Clara's resume. The net, 85. Pretty so, good. But we're still comparing a net 28 versus a net 85. Ken Palm, 83. Okay. We're comparing a 23 to an 83. In quad one games where BYU is 4-1, and one, the Broncos are 0-3. Okay? In quad two games, they're 1-2. And, and then quad three and four games, they're 11-2. So now that we have that information, yes, I am very surprised that BYU is not... Certainly the BPI, that's the one I think that surprises me the most, along with the 55% that they they sweep these two this week. That seems very, very low to me. I honestly don't have that big of an issue with the the minus three that Vegas has in terms of the odds for tonight. You're going on the road, I get it. Let's also not make the mistake of sweeping Santa Clara under the rug. This is probably one of their better teams in the last couple of years. They're a very good shooting team. They're top 30 from both the field and from three in shooting. So they are a good team. But I'm going to go old school and say the team that has the better metrics, Mm -hmm. the team that has the better record is going to win the game. And I think that should hold more weight than maybe it is right now. Does it matter that it's on the road and that BYU lost the last time they played there? Okay, that was that was four years ago. I know, not a Mark Pope team. It was four years ago. They haven't even played this team in two years. They didn't play last year. The last matchup was February of 2020. So this is not a team that they have faced recently. Look, I'm not saying that Santa Clara cannot beat BYU. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm I'm going in with much more confidence in BYU than it seems like uh, some people are. And that surprises me a little bit. Okay. Well, let me counteract with this. Santa Clara has played the majority of their season without their best player, Jason, Josef Brankic. And guess who's back for the Broncos? He back. Josef Brankic, who was a teammate of Caleb Lohner and Fusini Traore at uh, Wasatch Academy. How about that? He ended up with Herb Sendek in Santa Clara. He's their best player. He's back, and he's healthy, and he joins one of the best scorers in the country in Jalen Williams, and they're on their home floor. So I think about that little fact, and I'm like, okay, yeah, Santa Clara's probably going to be a better team. Then I look at the net rankings, and I look at some of the games that I thought BYU shouldn't have lost. I'm taking Utah Valley out of the equation because that was a totally – deflating scenario with Gavin Baxter going down with another season-ending injury. The bench just was not right. They were not mentally right after that. And they had four players who were playing with the flu. (laughs) Okay? So, uh, again, I I will take that one out of the equation. But the Vanderbilt game feels very similar to me, and I feel like a very similar team to what Santa Clara is going to roll out. Vanderbilt in the net right now, Jason. 
Number 90. Mm. Okay, Santa Clara 85. Also, Vanderbilt 2-5 and five in quad one games, 0-2 oh in quad two. They've not been great against the better teams, but Vanderbilt on a neutral court beat BYU head-to-head, and they've got an elite scorer in Scottie Pippen Jr., Jalen Williams is not as good as Scottie Pippen. He's Jr., really good, though. But he's really yes, good. He's very good. And now he has Josef Frankich, and they're playing on their home floor. So while on the surface we look at the record and the metrics, it's like, ah, yeah, BYU should win this game. The team that BYU is playing tonight is not the team that has been together for a majority of the season. I think Santa Clara is going to get better from here on out, and that's why I think it's so close in the projections. Look, and again, I, I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm saying that they have that BYU is guaranteed to win this game. They're going to have to play well. But here's the one thing that I like. We talk. I mentioned how how good of a shooting team they are. Well, BYU when BYU struggles, it's because of their offense, not their defense. Sure. Their defense has traveled. Their defense. Now you can take the Gonzaga game out of the equation because they're on another level, being able to score whenever they want. Nobody's defense travels against Gonzaga. But but BYU defensively is a very good defensive team. And so that's uh, that I think is going to be there. I think that helps slow down some of those shooting numbers that we've seen from Santa Clara. Again, when, when BYU has struggled, it's because the offense has struggled. I, I feel confident that the defense is going to, to do enough tonight that, that the, num- the numbers that we're seeing from Santa Clara hopefully come down a little bit. Again, it's not going to be an easy game. Anytime you go on the road, it's a difficult, if it's a difficult matchup. I just think BYU should be favored by more by the metrics than what they are right now. Yeah, and if you're looking at the very, very detailed metrics of Ken Pomeroy and you want to quantify BYU's defense and how good it is, they're a top 20 team in the country in defending the three-point line, and that's across all gyms yeah. they've played in this year. And their adjusted defensive efficiency is also top 25 right now, Jason. So, like, I get it. That's probably why BYU is favored to win on the road. Typically, a home court is worth like three points. Right. So if you played at a neutral site, BYU would be like a six-point favorite or a seven-point favorite, and they'll probably be like a ten-point favorite against Santa Clara if they were to play that game in the Marriott Center. So uh, the three points, it feels close, but I get it. I, I get it. I'm not worried because of what you brought up. I, I, so you can call it not sleep, or sleeping on the, uh, the Broncos or whatever. I don't feel like, oh, man, I'm really freaking out about tonight's game. It's not like I felt when BYU was going into the San Francisco game on the road, right, where BYU was a four-point underdog. They're still a favorite, and they play defense at an elite level. They rebound. If BYU makes some shots, yeah, it boils down to the offense. It really does. If, if they are a little bit better than they have been on average, then they'll probably win this game by 10 or 12. You know, so, it, yeah, it kind of feels like it's going to come down to how good is BYU's offense on the road against Santa Clara because I think the defense, they'll show up. That's what they do every game. The effort is always there. Look, maybe tomorrow when we're on the show, we're going to be looking back and talking about a Santa Clara win over BYU. I don't expect that to happen. I'm not going in thinking that BYU is going to lose this game. Everything tells me BYU should win this game. So I'm going into that. I, I'm, just, I'm just a little surprised that things – from the outside looking in, seem to be closer sure. than, than what I'm seeing. Okay. Well, I guess we shouldn't be surprised if indeed it is a close game tonight because Santa Clara is really good and they're getting better with the, uh, the return of some of their stars. Join the conversation 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook using the hashtag BYUSN. The best of BYU Sports Nation rolls on after this. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. What in the world happened last night to BYU basketball at Santa Clara? Jason, the Cougars were up four with 40 seconds remaining and had the ball. At that point, I texted my sister and said, BYU about to wrap up what I hope becomes another quad one victory. Uh, Check that, Spencer. 
That's not going to happen because BYU ultimately loses in the final seconds on a Jalen Williams runner. However, Jason, as much as this stings BYU fans and as much as it makes you want to pull your hair out as a BYU fan, did the loss last night hurt BYU's pride or tournament resume more? It's interesting because last night you felt it was both because you didn't have all of the information yet. You certainly felt bad because of the loss in general. So as a BYU fan, you were hurting for that simple fact. But you also thought, well, they've got to take a hit because it's another loss. Well, this morning actually brings a lot more clarity to that. And it looks like BYU really wasn't uh, given any negative marks for that loss last night in terms of the metrics. Most everything stayed the same for the Cougars. Look, and we spent a lot of time yesterday, talk, even though we certainly expected BYU to win the game, talking about how good Santa Clara was mm-hmm. and that this team is dangerous. Now, again, we expected BYU to win, and they should have won. It was just some too many mistakes at key moments during that last 45 seconds that cost the Cougars the game. But the, but the metrics today say that it did not hurt them. And so right now, you go in saying, well, right now it just dinged the pride. It's unbelievable that BYU, and this according to Ken Pomeroy's win probability chart that Greg Rubel <laughs> tweeted out last night, which, again, makes you want to pull out even more hair. BYU had a 90% chance of winning the game (laughs) with about 40 seconds to play. 90% chance to win the game. And then with eight seconds left, BYU still had an 83% chance to win the game, Jason. But it didn't happen. However, as you have pointed out, the BYU resume update today would suggest that it doesn't really matter in the long term. BYU drops one spot in the net rankings from 28 to 29. Okay, if you want to call that a hit, whatever. It cost BYU one spot in the net rankings. There are more than 350 NCAA Division I teams, by the way. (laughs) BYU stays the same in the Ken Palmer ratings, number 23. It did move them in bracketology off of Joe Lenardi's seven-seed line but not necessarily in his latest bracket. He had BYU as an eight seed. There's some difficulty there with trying to fit BYU into a Thursday, because Saturday of, yes, scenario. Of where they have to fit. So essentially they stay the same. An eight seed in bracketology, team rankings, 76% chance for BYU to still make the tournament. The Cougars did add a quadrant two victory last night because Weber State is getting better, and so BYU's win on the road in Ogden now counts Thanks, Weber. as a quad two win. So while BYU lost a quad two game, they pick up a quad two game all on the same night. Aren't metrics fun? Well, this is where this is where the analytics for for everybody that's anti analytics. This is one of those times where analytics helps ease the pain a little bit because the metrics and the numbers don't change very much at all. And so, even though it stings that BYU lost a game that they should not have lost, it should not hurt them in terms of their ultimate goals and going to the postseason and in the NCAA tournament. That's the good news. The other good news is this team has shown resiliency game in and game out. After a loss, they come back, and they're going to Pacific, okay? Yeah, mark it down. BYU is going to beat Pacific. Look, Pacific's and still looking for its first conference win. Mark so, Pope's not going to lose yes. back-to-back games in the regular season. Yes, they're going to beat the Pacific Tigers. So there's plenty of time to get back on another run, which I fully expect them to do. I do think, in a little way, that BYU not winning that game at Santa Clara may hurt the Cougars' chances of finishing second place in the West Coast Conference, Jason, because St. Mary's erased a 23-point deficit at San Francisco last night and won. So this puts BYU's chances of being in the top two and having a bye all the way to the conference tournament semifinals in peril. Well, but just, Now, now you've got to beat St. Mary's yes, and at, win the rest of your games. You have, to, you have to beat St. Mary's in Moraga. Probably, right? You can't slip up again. Right. Or you have to hope that St. Mary slips up somewhere. Sure. Which, look, if you're going to get down by 23, maybe they're, maybe they're more vulnerable than, okay. than we thought. Yes, they came back, but, you know, you never know. So I think that hurts a little bit. And then if BYU had beaten Santa Clara, then they're probably a seven seed when Bracketology comes out on Monday from Joe Lenardi and not an eight seed, which I like. I just like the idea of BYU not being in the 8-9 game. Yeah. But there's still opportunity for them to get out of that, right? Yeah. Look, the good news is we're telling everybody, yes, it stings that BYU lost the game, but it doesn't necessarily change the trajectory 
of where they're going in the postseason. So that is certainly a welcome sight after the loss last night. All right, moving on to topic number two. Yesterday, Athletic Director Tom Holmo met with the media to discuss a variety of topics. Spencer, of all the things that were discussed, and there were a lot, uh, to you, what was the most interesting thing that Tom Holmo mentioned yesterday? Well, I think I am in line with what Kalani Satake is most interested in, and that is bolstering the staff for BYU football, specifically as the Cougars try and get on par with and compete in the Big 12 and those major programs because their football staffs overall, I'm not talking just like assistant coaches, we're talking recruiting coordinators, meal planners, strength and conditioning, having multiple people in all of those aspects of your program. They just have way more people. And so, not surprisingly, Tom Holmo was asked about this. Will BYU find its place as far as staffing goes in the Big 12? This is what the athletic director had to say. Are we going to be able to match Oklahoma or Kansas? If you look at Kansas' basketball operation, are we, do, are we, do we think we're going to just go right to the top? Where do we go? Well, I'm talking about in terms of uh, structure. And the answer is no. That's where we have to be smart enough and strategic enough to try to get to the point where we feel we're best to start. And then we may overshoot or be way under. But you want to be as close to where you think is right for BYU. And that's what we're doing right now. So to me, Jason, that means that BYU is going to add more staffers, not as many as Kansas and Oklahoma, but they will add some and try and do so in a very, very, as he said, strategic way. Well, and the way I took it, it was that, look, if we say, okay, Oklahoma and Texas have X number of guys, that doesn't mean we have to have the exact same number. But we go in thinking this is what's going to work for BYU. Then when BYU gets in it, then you say, okay, well, based off of what we thought, maybe we need to adjust this. Maybe we need to adjust adding four or five more. To, or or may, maybe we actually have too many now. So I think it's, it was all about we need to do what's best for us now. Then when we get in, we can adjust it further based off of what the actual reality is once we're there. I think, and I think that's a great way to approach it. Okay, what about you? What was number one for you? Look, uh, there were a lot of things, but, but one of the things that stood out to me was when he talked about recruiting. Because what do we say? It's a cliche. It's the lifeblood of any program. It's how you can recruit. And I loved how emphatic Tom was talking about how things have improved in such a short period of time since announcing they're going to the Big 12 regarding their recruiting. Yeah, there's no question the recruiting is totally different. I, I want to separate those. I think our recruits understand that. We... we I don't think there's any question that we lost recruits in the past because we weren't a member of a uh, Power Five conference. And some of those recruits had offers to play in a P5 conference. And now that can't be the argument. No, and, and I like what he's like. It's, it may not necessarily, it's not going to change everything, but something that, uh, that was viewed as a negative against BYU is no longer on the table for others to use. So it helps even the playing field that they're now going to be a P5 uh, member uh, of a conference. Yeah. While you wouldn't have gotten some of the bigger recruits that are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the past, now you've put yourself in a category to truly compete with Utah and Stanford and Oregon and USC saying, hey, we are a P5 now. In fact, if you don't want to play in the Pac-12 and you want to test your skills in the Big 12, why don't you come this direction? This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Hear what the coaches, athletes, and experts have to say. Here's another great interview from the week on the best of BYU Sports Nation. Joining us now and repping a different type of shirt, which we also love, is ESPN play-by-play specialist, friend of the program, Roxy Bernstein. Roxy, you look fantastic in that long sleeve BYU Sports Nation t-shirt. If it's free, Spence, it's for me. (laughs) (laughs) We've got some more stuff for you for sure. (laughs) Hey, Roxy, you know what? BYU Sports Nation's hurting a little bit this morning because they saw a 90-plus percent chance of winning the game against Santa Clara with under a minute to play at the Levy Center last night, and then it kind of just blew up in BYU's face. Did that loss last night hurt BYU's pride or NCAA tournament more, in your opinion? 
I, I think it hurt their pride more than their spot in the field right now. Just because they've done enough work to this point with some quality wins. Like, for example, the blowout win against Oregon looks better every day with Oregon playing better, even though the Ducks lost to Colorado on Tuesday. But I think they've done enough work. And so now, and they've also had to adjust, of course, playing without the two big guys, and they're doing it. But they also benefit guys. I, I think for the, the league is really good this year. This is the best we've seen the WCC, and it's not just the four teams that are right now projected in the field by Joe Lenardi. But the bottom of the league is better. There are no gimmies anymore, and I think that's helped the quality and depth of the conference and why the league is perceived better. Roxy, did anything change your opinion on where BYU ends up in the conference with the loss last night? Obviously, with St. Mary's coming back from 23 down to win that game, BYU still has to go to Moraga to play the Gales. Uh, do you think they still end up in the number two spot, which is, you know, we, it looked like they were destined for that. Do you think that's still the case? I think it's going to be tough because I, I, I like the way St. Mary's is coming on now, and you alluded to the game last night. They stole one, right? They were down 38-15. Sheesh. And somehow they found a way to come back on the hilltop on the road in San Francisco and win. So uh, that's a critical victory for them. They played better recently. I like the veteran experience that St. Mary's has. Now, BYU has the win over the Gales, and they still have to play Gonzaga as well. It's not going to be easy for anybody just to automatically walk to the second spot, but we know how critical getting that two seed is when you get to Orleans Arena in Vegas. You get the double bye. So this is going to be a challenge for both teams to finish strong. I just, at this point, I think St. Mary's has a little bit more, and what concerns me about BYU is the lack of size. Yes, Fusini Traore does a lot of things for you. But Matthias Toss is playing at such a high level for St. Mary's. He's a difficult matchup, I think, for BYU. Yeah, for me, where it hurts the most, if we're talking positioning and resume, no, BYU's still a tournament team like you've talked about, Roxy. But, man, it kind of feels like BYU losing at Santa Clara has now the Cougars pacing for that number three spot. And you got to play on Saturday instead of being able to wait until Monday, which stings. But we'll see how it plays out. As it pertains to a four-bid conference, San Francisco losing last night, are you still buying the West Coast Conference as a four-bid league for the NCAA tournament? The eye test tells me that USF is a tournament team. So that would be the fourth in my eyes with BYU, St. Mary's, and certainly Gonzaga in the field. But USF's had two heartbreaking, just gut-wrenching losses. When you look at the loss to BYU that San Francisco had at home, to the Cougars were, okay, BYU burped one up last night at Santa Clara. BYU also, I thought, stole that game from USF. Yeah. USF should be kicking themselves for losing that game to BYU. But so now the Dons, they can't get it back. They have some work to do. That was a really good road win for BYU. But USF right now is teetering, and that loss last night at home hurts a lot. They're going to have to beat somebody maybe along the way that they're not anticipated beating, whether that's going – to the Marriott Center in winning, if whether it's in Vegas knocking somebody off. I don't anticipate anybody beating Gonzaga from the league this year just because I think they're that much better than everybody else. But they will still have some challenges, like going to the Marriott Center. The Zags also have to go to St. Mary's. But for USF, they still have a little bit of work to do. I wouldn't feel as good about my position if I'm Todd Golden right now as I do about it if I'm Mark Pope or Randy Bennett. You mentioned Foose a second ago, and you've obviously had an opportunity to see him up close a couple of times, and his story is just phenomenal. And the fact that he's doing what he's doing when this was not expected to be his role at all, and he's excelling at it, certainly um, as the season goes on and, and in conference play. What do you like about his story and, and really what he brings on a team that you mentioned is starved for some size? Well, look, he's only 6'6", six, six, right? But we've seen the wingspan and the physicality and the toughness that he brings. But what I love about his game is his energy and that no-quit determination. He's always hustling. He's always looking to make plays. And the excitement, it just seems like it's infectious. And his teammates genuinely love playing with him. So that's the thing that really strikes me when I watch him play for BYU. And 
it, not just him, but you look at Atiki Ali. Atiki wasn't supposed to have a big role on this team either. You're expecting uh, Baxter to have and Harward to have huge roles for BYU, but out of necessity, you never know when that opportunity is going to come. And I think Foos is probably a little bit more ready for it at this point than Atiki Ali Atiki, but they're needed on this team out of necessity. And Mark Pope is going to give them opportunities because he needs them. And this team can't win without those two guys. But certainly what Foos has brought to the table has been welcome for this locker room considering what they've had to deal with. Roxy Bernstein, dual threat play-by-play guy for ESPN, does both college basketball and college football, does fantastic work for the Pac-12 Network as well. Let's segue to football before we say goodbye to you, Roxy. BYU now becoming a member of the Big 12, and that happens in 2023, leading one more season of independence with, you know, a few more Pac-12 teams. But uh, as far as it goes from 2023 on, what do you see BYU's future with the Pac-12 in football being like in terms of scheduling when BYU is playing eight or nine conference games in the Big 12? That's the tough thing is, okay, how many – conference games are both going to be playing. Will the Pac-12 drop from nine? Will they go to an eight-game league schedule? That could open opportunities for BYU to continue some of these regional series. Certainly, everybody wants to see the rivalry with Utah continue. I think it's great for everybody. But you're going to have limitations on it when you go into a conference. Right now, you're playing 12 games, and you have a slate basically to schedule who you want until you go into the Big 12. That's going to change. And some of these great games with USC we've seen over the years, Cal, Stanford, uh, Washington, you're not going to be able to have that flexibility anymore, and especially if you want to keep that rivalry with Utah. There's going to be challenges for Tom Homo and everybody to navigate through to keep those regional rivalries going, but I think everybody really wants to see that Utah game still stay on the schedule. Since you mentioned Cal, uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on um, Chris Brooks, the running back that uh, is now uh, with Kalani Satake in the BYU football program. What, uh, what can you tell our listeners and viewers about Chris? I was a big Christopher Brooks fan when he was at Cal, formerly Christopher Brown as well. Uh, then he changed his name to honor his mom. But Christopher Brooks is a tough physical runner. He is quicker than you think he is when you look at him because he's got a big frame. And the other thing that I really like about his game is his versatility. Yes, he can run between the tackles. He's really good in pass protection as well as catching the ball out of the backfield. So he's not just, okay, pound and ground and four or five yards of carry and just chewing up the defense. He can also do some things that hurt you on the outside. So I like the versatility that BYU will be getting with Christopher Brooks transferring there. I think he's going to have an impact, certainly, uh, with the BYU offense because of his versatility. No, I can't wait to see him run behind BYU's very experienced and talented offensive line. Roxy, before you go, I need to ask, can you confirm, along with UCLA, that Justin Wilcox is still the head football coach at Cal? <laughs> oh, boy. That, how, what are, was it PFF College that yes. tweeted that out? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Well, look, we know he turned down the Oregon job, so that, that wasn't going to happen. You know, people were skeptical. Was Chip Kelly going to sign that extension? But I can confirm that Justin Wilcox (laughs) is the head coach of the number one public university in the world, the University of California at Berkeley. Yes. No matter what Bill Walton says, I deal in fact. What does Bill deal in? (laughs) That's a very good question. I don't think we want to know the answer to that. Oh, my goodness. Has there ever been a greater question than that? (laughs) By the way, you know, you got your Bengals and your Chiefs. Nobody has a Tom Homo 49ers jersey. What's up with that? We need that. This is a great point you bring up, Roxy. Somebody's got to break that out. Yeah, we've asked him about that. He's a Super Bowl champion. Can we get one of those? We're also waiting for a Steve Young Tampa Bay Buccaneers jersey as well. So we need to get both of those things in studio. Only if it's the creamsicle. Yes, yes, the creamsicle that's the one. for sure. Yes, it yes. has to be. Hey, Roxy, yes. thanks for hanging out Definitely. with us. We know how busy you are. Uh, we look forward to your calls this weekend. Uh, enjoy those, and we'll talk again soon.
Anytime, fellas. Good to catch up with you. Roxy Bernstein, He's favorite great. of BYU Sports Nation, rocking the BYUSN swag. As he said, if it's free, it's for me. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there's nothing wrong with wearing the free swag. We all want it, and we all love it. We should send him some more. Yes, we should. We'll be right back with more of the best of BYU Sports Nation. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. It's a huge storyline that obvious, obviously we've talked about a lot. But I almost, I almost don't believe it, that you can ask uh, Fusini Traore and Atiki Ali Atiki, two dudes not even from this continent, we've talked about it, Muslims at a Christian school, totally like culture, different country, continent, religion, that they have embedded themselves in this amazing way and have thrived on and off the court for this team to where they are a top 25 group. It's, it's incredible. And they're a big part of that. But the main part is that you have Alex Barcelo and Tijon Lucas. You have two sixth-year guards, and that cannot be understated. Yeah, and that overstated. Guard play, and then here's the thing. I, I'm sorry that I put it all on this, but to me, if we're going to judge a team, it's like we call that 81 team that, was honored this last weekend, the best team in BYU history, because yes. they went to the Elite Eight. Yes. So what you do in postseason is the mark you leave. <sighs> we'll right? never know in well, 1920. The, 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 the we'll mark, never know. I know. That's the mark or you leave. will we in the hereafter? Can it, I, we'll, we'll I want to ask God, what would have happened? There's going to be basketball in the hereafter. Would they have gone we to the Sweet this. 16? <laughs> I, I have a lot of questions. I Dinosaurs. Think- and uh, the 1920. And, and, and if, if Brandon Davies is still playing in 2011, do they go to the Final Four? It's a Final Four team. <laughs> it's a fi- hey, just trust me. That's a Final Four team. <laughs> and and I felt like with Baxter and Harward, this was a top 12 team. Like when they were 12, um, it felt legit. It it they were a top 12 team. Would they and be there right now if those two were absolutely. healthy? In your opinion? Yeah, I think they'd be in the top 10 right now. Because, because I, think they have, I think they have two or three less losses. I think they have one or two losses. Well, uh, at Gonzaga, check. Besides and, and, and that, and is maybe there one, one? I don't know. I, I think Creighton? they beat Vanderbilt. I think they beat Creighton. Vanderbilt, for sure. Creighton yeah. would have been a better matchup. Yeah. yeah. I, two at worst right now. So I think they're a top 10 team with those guys. Um, they certainly don't u- lose the UVU. No. I mean, they, they don't lose the UVU if, if Gavin Baxter goes out of the game and they say he just has a strained knee, he's going to continue. I feel like they were battling the flu. But when they found out that he had an ACL tear after he just did that a year ago, I felt like that team, like you could visibly see all emotion just sucked right out of that team. Yeah. And they still went to overtime. So there's no way they lose that game. Yeah. And, and so I say they're, they're at one or maybe two losses right now. With sitting those two at guys. like seven. So, so, but to your point – all of a sudden, Fuse's had to grow up. Atiki's had to grow up. Loners had to step yes, up. That Seneca, was the best and, thing for them. And so here's here's what I don't know, but I like their trajectory. Yeah. Look what Seneca Knight's done in the last last couple of weeks. Fourteen in back to back games, right? He's coming. He's finally figured out where he fits into this offense. Mm-hmm. Look what Caleb Loner's done in two of his last three games. All of a sudden, he's done some good things. So they're already playing at a really high level. If the trajectory and Fuse just keeps getting better, if if the trajectory continues like this. This team could end up a Sweet 16 basketball team. Then we're going to be talking different about it. We're going to be saying, yeah. Right? Yeah. It's only happened twice. Absolutely. And and it's required a National Player of the Year to do that both times. I'm looking for BYU to do that without having this all-time player (laughs) and, like, top – well, picks in the NBA, like it doesn't always what, require that. What I should mention, Chicago's gone to the Final Four. What like, I should have mentioned that. is, Come on. the coaches talk about D and rebounding, and then they go, and we don't even know how to stop Adams Barcelo. Making life difficult for the Pac-12, isn't it about time? <laughs> BYU doing what it does best. John Wilner of the San Jose Mercury News released a news article this morning citing BYU's inclusion in the Big 12 as a potential big problem for the Pac-12 moving forward in non-conference scheduling. Obviously, BYU has had a nice relationship with the Pac-12, thus so many games with the Pac-12, but when you play nine conference games in the Big 12, you can't really play many Pac-12 opponents, or you wouldn't choose to do so, you would think. However, Jerem, we have both been very vocal about wanting at least one Pac-12 opponent, Utah, yeah. Yeah. on the schedule every year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to ask you the question again. I want you to explain. Do you want BYU to schedule Utah every year as a member of the Big 12 when they get in there? Or do you want 
other Pac-12 teams to get sprinkled in there? I want 12 Power Fives. Because, no, that's what some of you have called for them. Um, let's read this quote before I answer that. Internally, BYU's moving to the Big 12 presents us significant scheduling issues, said Merton Hanks. Mm-hmm. The next thing. Uh, the Pac-12 Senior Associate Commissioner-in-Chief of Football Operations. I did not do that, Justin. Former 49er? Right yeah. I, I was like, first off, Merton Hanks is with the Pac-12. That's awesome. Um, okay, BYU has 15 games scheduled with the Pac-12 in the future. Six with Stanford, six with Utah, two with Arizona, and one with USC. So what do you do with all those, right? You got you got to cancel a lot of them. Do I want Utah every year? Almost every year. Like 95%, you know? That's a lot. That's a lot of red. There may be a scenario right. where it just doesn't work lot, out well for both teams and scheduling agreements, and maybe it's not the best thing for Utah and BYU. I hate it when that happens. Here's what but... Utah needs. It's all about us now. You know what? We're going to be on a level plan. Utah cancel the next few years with Florida. Dot dot dot. Florida actually stinks. Utah should win both those games. So I, I want it most of the time. Now, be, it. Let me explain what I want on the other games, and that will dictate why the Utah game is uh, the, what that spot is. I would like a home group of five game that isn't like a 10-plus win program, okay? So a team you can beat, right, at home. I don't want Cincinnati. I don't want, like, necessarily even Boise State, I think. I just want, like, a winnable game because the Big 12 slate is going to be tough. Then I would like an FCS team. So you're talking about, like, a UNLV. um, Like, everyone below Utah State, if you will. Like, they can't be a team that can actually Colorado State. Yeah, sure, whatever. Like a like a middle to lower, yeah. Colorado State's probably somewhere in the middle to upper. But anyway, just like a, a winnable game, okay? okay? Because I care more about winning than I care about puffing, pluming out the non conference feathers. Because guess what? The Big Twelves welcome to Power Five football. If BYU goes five and four consistently in league, that would be awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like six and three, wow. Um, seven and two is crazy. Eight and one, like will that even ever happen? I don't know. Don't, it's not going to happen. No, never. Um, if 84 played in the Big 12 now, they wouldn't go 9-0 and or even 8-1. and 7-2 would probably be like the top of the mountain. So the Utah game represents like the, the big non-conference game. Sure. I think that is probably what I want every year. But if you told me occasionally like a Notre Dame and Vegas type situation or you can do a home and road with a big program, a Tennessee, for example. Yeah, I, I would like that occasionally at the cost of Utah, but not a ton. Like, I would like to play Utah probably eight out of every ten years. Okay. Uh, like, very consistently. I don't see the need to play ten, uh, sorry, 11 or 12 Power Fives. <laughs> that just sounds stupid, okay? More Power Fives, please. Let's say that Utah can't play the game against BYU for whatever reason, and I'm not talking about 23 and Scheduling 24. Scheduling will be harder now. Sure. Yeah. Let's say that Utah can't do it in 2027, and there's a team like – USC or Oregon that's like, hey, we'll play you, but we want you to play us here. That's fine. Would you take that game? Yeah. You would go and play on the road at Oregon or at USC. Yeah, because I want home G5, home FC. Yes. I would okay. like I would like six or obviously six, but I would like seven home games sometimes. It is my preference with you that BYU, if possible, can play Utah every year. I think the idea of a Pac-12, Big 12 challenge, longtime rivals, is very fun because now it's really more on even playing ground, right? Both teams are in Power 5 conferences. So the idea that Utah, oh, you just can't hang with our recruiting. Like, it does us no good to beat. No, it does Utah good to play and beat BYU if it's a Power 5 team. No, That conversation of beating a lower-tier it, independent team always, is gone. No, it's always been beneficial for yes. BYU to play Utah. yes. Yeah. Utah fans don't feel so, but it, it's, well, it's, some, a, it's like a good Darryl game. Well, like Daryl in your ward that is a <laughs> no, no. loser. I'm not talking about just Daryl. I'm talking about some <laughs> people that have significant opinions at Utah. What's up, Bill Riley? How you doing, buddy? Like, that conversation has been prevalent. Does it even help Utah? Well, now I think it does. Congrats. USC has stunk. You finally won the Pac-12. That You're done. USC is going to be good again with Lincoln Riley. I hope you enjoyed it. That's how I feel. <laughs> And I listen, I, I want that game, but if it can't happen, I am absolutely open to the idea of if an Ohio State or another Big Ten program or SEC program and Auburn's like, hey, BYU, you want to do a one-off? Brian Harson. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Let's go. Let's yes. do it. I don't want two of these type of games, though, because the Big 12 will be tough enough. You want an FCS? Want you want one, a winnable G5? One big non-conference Easy game. win G5. Yes. 
Not easy, just winnable. Yeah. Join the conversation 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook using the hashtag BYUSN. The best of BYU Sports Nation rolls on after this. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. It is our pleasure now to welcome in the man who controls women's college basketball bracketology for ESPN. His name is Charlie Cream, returning to the program. Good morning, Charlie. Great to talk with you. Oh, good to be back with you guys. Yes, and good morning to you. It's fantastic to see BYU on that three-seed line as well. Not going to lie, the Cougars have worked hard to get there, but not always is a winning team going to climb as fast as they have. So why are the metrics, the net basketball rankings and whatnot, in favor of BYU right now so that they are on the three-seed line already? I think the big thing with seeding uh, and net rankings and, and going back years and before we had the net, it's the schedule. You, gotta, you have to play a good schedule in the non-conference, especially if you're in a league like the WCC that doesn't have a ton of depth to it. You're not going to get a lot of tournament worthy teams in your conference season. So you have to go out and schedule and BYU has done that this year. And then you have to produce against that schedule. BYU has also done that. You put those two things together and then teams outside the power five or six conferences have a chance to make some noise, to get a higher seed, to let the metrics sort of speak for themselves and, and that's happened this season. It's all, kind of all come together perfectly for BYU. But it, it comes down to who you play and beating who you play. And BYU's done really well on both fronts. Well, and I think that's something that Jeff Judkins has done a great job of, not just recently where there does seem to be much more emphasis on strength of schedule. He has always been a guy that's been willing to go and schedule tough teams early. But to your point, this is the year that not only do you get the really tough schedule, but you have the results to back it up. And, and that's, that's something that could propel this team to a, quite honestly, a really special year. Absolutely, because not only does it put them in position for a higher seed, which is special, it's super special if it becomes high enough as to where I project them to be right now inside those top 16 teams or a top four seed and get to host a couple of games in the first couple of rounds. That's super special. That's something that every program really shoots for at the beginning of the season. If it's not a national championship goal that they're talking about kind of next level stuff is, Hey, can we get a top four seed and host a couple of games? So just in that respect alone, we're looking at the possibility of, of this being kind of a special March, but also going out there and playing those teams prepares you for when you do get into the tournament, because that's all you're going to be playing outside of probably the first round. That's all you're going to be playing the rest of the way is teams like BYU scheduled earlier in the year, teams like Washington state or Arizona state or Oklahoma. So they're ready. Not, so not only did it reward them with a good seed, but they're ready to actually do some damage in the tournament as well. Charlie Cream of ESPN Women's College Basketball. The bracketologist is with us on BYU Sports Nation. We had an inkling of what this BYU team was capable of last year, taking a very good Arizona team that went to the national championship game down to the wire in the second round. So, Charlie, having seen that, is this surprising at all to you to see what BYU has done because they brought everybody back? Well, it's not entirely surprising. I mean, I did have them projected as a, a easy tournament team as the favorite in the WCC and, and really thought that they would be a team, to, you know, to kind of keep an eye on as a, as a team that could get to a second weekend in the tournament, but keeping an eye on it and then being a favorite, which is kind of where they put themselves in position to be now is are two different things. I didn't see three seed on January 27th. I saw, you know, as I probably projected them in the beginning of the season, something like a six seed, so this is a step up from where I, I thought they'd be. And I think a lot of people as well. I don't think they were projected to be deep into the top 25 like they are in the AP rankings. And I, I certainly didn't think that as we're heading into February that we'd be talking about them possibly hosting those first two rounds of the NCAA tournament. Charlie, we've spent a lot of time talking about the strength of schedule and just who BYU has played and beaten what are the metrics telling you uh, is, is BYU's best win? Wh which, which victory is helping the Cougars out the most at this point? 
Gosh, that's a good question because it's more of a collection with them. But I th I'd say Utah at this point because Utah's net raking is way up there as well. Uh, Arizona State's kind of uh, fluttering on the bubble just on the outside right now. But, but the way I look at it, and I, and, and, I, and I hope some of the committee members look at it, is you know we, get it, we have a collection of teams that we're analyzing. And how did you perform as, as one of those teams against other tournament worthy or quality teams doesn't necessarily mean teams that are that are definitely in the tournament but just teams that are worthy of consideration what's your record against those teams and in, and in BYU's case they have about four or five of those wins and they and one of and the, and the best team they played Oklahoma they, they went to overtime against and that was boy that was a fantastic yes, game it was. Way, just as, as an aside wow that was a great game uh, so that's the way that's the way I look at it. I think that's the way some of the committee members look at it as well. Because what you're what you're doing is you're trying to put the best teams in the tournament in the best positions based on their their resumes. And what what's what a better way to, to view a team than how they do against teams that are actually also would be in the tournament or would be considered in the tournament. So that's the way I, I kind of look at it. And when, when you take all these other pieces to the puzzle together, but when it comes right down to it, how did you play against tournament caliber teams? And the Utah, I, I'll, I'll point to that one, is probably the best win. But with, with BYU, it's it's more of a collective against uh, what was a good non-conference schedule that included a lot of those teams. He is Charlie Cream. He is a bracketology rock star for ESPN discussing BYU women's <laughs> basketball right now. And when you look at what BYU is right now, a three seed, and, and again, this is a fantastic scenario for Jeff Judkins and his squad. But based on what they have left on the schedule, a couple of tougher games against Gonzaga, but not much else on paper. How high or how much higher can BYU realistically climb? I think three is might be the ceiling. Two would be, would need some help. Um, it, it's kind of a, it's a double-edged sword, right? BYU doesn't have a lot of losses left on, on its schedule, Maybe, you know, with the possibility of maybe losing one of those games to Gonzaga, maybe losing a game in the WCC tournament. However, they don't have a lot of resume building games in there either. So the record is going to be fantastic and they're not going to lose ground necessarily, but gaining ground is going to be hard because all the teams in front of them where they could lose are also playing other games where when they win them, they're, they're beefing up their resume. So kind of pushing past uh, like for right now, I, I have BYU as a three seed, but I have them as the last three seed, so number twelve overall. Sure. So they'd have to to get to the two line. They have to push through three other four, really four other teams, and those four other teams almost on a nightly basis now, or or certainly on a weekly basis, are playing resume building type games. So even a loss can be counteracted by a win, and and usually a win, the the value of a win is better than. Or, or weighs more than what a loss does to you. So those teams just have a better chance of either maintaining or improving their position. So it's going to be tough for BYU to kind of crack any higher, but, it, but with the right help and with enough losses in, in front of them, it, a two seed isn't impossible. Charlie, last thing, and let's take this from just BYU and expand it out to the West Coast Conference. On the men's side, we're talking about the possibility that maybe the WCC is a four-bid league. On the women's side of things, what's the chance that uh, the West Coast Conference is a multi-bid league? I think it's decent. I mean, remember, we're talking about there's, there's 68 teams in the field this year, which is new. So there's, there's four more at-large spots up for grabs. And if it's BYU and Gonzaga, you know, let, let's play it out to where they both – make the WCC tournament championship game and Gonzaga doesn't, doesn't lose it probably would help the conference a little bit more. If Gonzaga could get one of those games against BYU, Yeah, it might, it might hurt BYU's seed ultimately, but to be honest, if they're a three or a four, they're still hosting games. They're still in, in good position to do some damage in the tournament, but it also benefits Gonzaga's chance of, of getting into the field. Cause right now I have Gonzaga right there on the bubble. What's also benefiting the chances of, of the WCC being a multi-bid league is that some of the middle of the pack or, or even you know lower end of the SEC, for instance, and the ACC aren't playing particularly well. Teams like Texas A&M and Kentucky and the SEC, who we all thought were going to be easy tournament teams, no problem. They're really struggling. So it, with four more spots available to at-large teams and some of the larger conferences maybe not having 
the depth of, of bids that we thought they were going to get opens up some opportunities. And Gonzaga would be a team that could walk into that opportunity. Charlie, we appreciate and respect so much what you do. We know how busy you are, traveling man, with everything that's going on. So thanks for taking some time with us. And I'm guessing that we'll probably be talking to you again before we get to the bracket, if you're all right with that. I am very okay with that. But I look forward to it. It'd be great. Be, talking BYU hoops is, is a lot of fun. This team is a real enjoyable watch. Fantastic stuff. Charlie, thanks so much for your time. You got it, guys. That wraps up the best of BYU Sports Nation this week. Tune in next Saturday for the Cougar news you need to hear. And catch the BYU Sports Nation simulcast every day at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific on BYU TV and BYU Radio.